From the world of AV programming and control with James King, I'm Steve Greenblatt, and this is Ask the Programmer. Hey, James, how are you today? We have a special episode to, for everybody in our audience. Oh, yeah. So I, I'm doing great. And you're right. I've been looking forward to getting uh, Frank on for a while, and this is going to be a great one. Absolutely. So we we uh, very, very we have the pleasure of having Frank Patakala from Audinate uh, join us today. Welcome, Frank. Thank you so much, Stephen James. This is an absolute privilege. I love. I've heard your show. You know, I've been following it. I've promoted it, and you know, it's great to be on it. So thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for being with us. We, you know, we your names come up quite a bit in some of our <laughs> discussions. Where we, you know, always enjoy hearing your perspective on the industry. Um, your support for for software in AV, for programming, and also the work that Audinate's doing. So we just wanted to get to know you a little bit better because one thing that you have that's a little special um, for many people in the audience is that your background doesn't purely come from AV, but you found yourself attracted and, and you've gravitated to AV from the IT space. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and and what you have found uh, that does to the way you approach AV systems and AV conversations. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, let's let's get the introductions out of the way. Uh, my name is Frank Patakala. I'm currently working for Audinate as a technical sales engineer as part of the system solutions team. Uh, what the system solutions team does and works on is primarily building out solutions based on Dante. Uh, you've all I'm, I'm assuming a lot of the AV industry has used Dante. It's very popular and uh, it's a networked AV technology. Started off with audio. Now we've kind of ventured into video. Uh, but what we do in our team is we build out solutions that are beyond the standard Dante implementations. And that kind of gets me involved. And like, you know, like Steve said, a lot of my background is in IT. So, you know, I went to school for IT. I have a master's in cybersecurity. Uh, I have a ton of certifications, which I still maintain and, you know, keep up to date and then try to get new certifications every now and then. Uh, and that's, that's, that's my biggest perspective on these things. Cause I feel like we are all part of a technology blanket. I keep using that term wherever I get an opportunity. AV for long has been a very physical, you know, it's exterior, it's visual. There's, there's a, there's a physical piece to AV, but a lot of times we've not understood that behind the scenes, AV has always been powered by IT technologies and to that matter, software. There's always software at some level that has powered the technologies that we've done. I mean, ever since we've got into the digital world, I'm mean, sure analog times, you know, we've had uh, things built on analog, but the principles of electronics, which then evolved into software, uh, software enables a lot of the things that the analog world did and it does it more efficiently, right? So I've always seen that there's a role for that. It's just unfortunate that, we AV and AV also tend to put up these little barriers to entry, which says, oh, you know, you need to do this. You need to do that. I don't believe in those. I think that anyone can become successful in AV because the principles in AV are very much similar to what the other industries have. And for that matter, the pains that we have in AV are also what other people, I mean, you could have a conversation with a network engineer and you'll say, hey, you know, I just wish I was there at the beginning of the planning phase of the project. And the network engineer will say, same. I wish I was there too. Uh, and the programmer will say, you know what? I wish I was there. So a lot of things that ails tech affects us just like the other industries are affected by as well. So there's some, there's a solidarity there we should be building, which also means there's this huge pool of resources and knowledge that's out there that we're not leveraging. So yeah, I'm a huge software fan. There's no questions about it. When things got virtual, I got into virtual. When things are going to the cloud, I'll be there in the cloud. And wherever it goes, that's also us, right? We keep learning. And I think that's uh, that's a good thing for AV. So that's that's kind of my uh, very long intro. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's wonderful. Very well put. And I think that that's a lot. I'm going to try to remember a lot of those when I start to talk to more people about what that looks like. And and J James has always been promoting and, and will probably forever promote uh, that AV is IT. So yes. Um, Oh James, yeah. What, what That's how James with? and I first started. Like we were like, you know, we were the most vocal ones out there saying, cause you know, you can find excuses as to why AV is not IT, but at any given point of time, 
the the force, the pros for AV is IT will outweigh the cons any day, you know. And if you think otherwise, you're just trying to make an excuse for it. I'm not asking that people quit their jobs and say, all right, I'm going to be in IT anymore. If you if that's what's, you know, if mentally that's a roadblock for you, if you feel that being in IT is somehow different or inferior to AV, go for it. Call yourself AV. But we are technology. There's no denying that. You can't deny the fact that we are a technology industry that is now overlapped into so much of the other side of IT, right? It's like, the way COVID has hit us and with the changes that has happened over the last couple of years, if you say we're still not IT and if we're not technology, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I agree. And the thing is, so many people look at when you say AV is IT, they're going to say, well, just because you throw it on the network. Network is a very sliver of IT. Networking Absolutely. is not IT. Is yep. IT is part of, or networking is part of IT. It's mm -hmm. not IT itself. And like Frank, you said, is, he said it so elegant so many times. It's, it's a principle. It's a, it's a mindset that we're in with technology. And that's what makes us IT. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to that matter, programming as well. I mean, so we've had programming uh, and, you know, I, I feel so uniquely privileged here because Steve is somebody who I look up to in the industry as well as James, because the two of you represent very unique uh, career paths right there. Steve's an entrepreneur who has built a company and I'm doing interest for you at this point. Uh, you know why I'm doing this? It's because, you know, the listeners have asked the programmer, we're going to have an episode two. I'm just introing without Steve and James's permission. The episode two is going to be a crossover episode. You'll be able to hear it on the IT factor too. So I'm going to cross post it. So we want both our listeners to understand that these are two amazing individuals. Steve has built a company that's built on the concepts of programming and as a service provider. So who is Steve? Is he, a, is he an integrator? Is he a programming company? Is he a software vendor developer? He's all of that, right? They do, they do all of that. And I know this because I've worked with Steve's company at a professional level. James is someone who has a programming IT background who's working in AV. These are very unique perspectives. For so long, programming has been that last little piece of the project schedule. If you look, if you're a project manager listening to this or an engineer, you, I need you to look at your Gantt chart today and look at the time allocated for programming. It's usually at that very end, right before, you know, the commissioning phase so that, yeah, the programming and, and then, you know, and the thought is, oh, we've done this room a thousand times. No big deal. We can repeat it. I think there's more to it than that. You know, it's not. It's not just the old programming and programming has evolved. I mean, the two people on this call can talk to this better than myself, but AV and programming has evolved from, you know, from the very basic, you know, sort of like block level programming to a functionality to the advanced lines of coding that's involved in today's programs. There's been a huge evolution. So, you know, programming is essentially at that foundation of making an AV project successful. My question is, do we see it that way, right? Do we do we understand how important this thing is? It's 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 not an afterthought, you know. It's it's a part of your project, and you know, I'm I'm glad we're having this conversation. I could tell you one thing: you're going to make a lot of friends in our audience. So I yes. should I, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's about making people aware that the next time you design a project, you know, you if you're an engineer, um, and I'll, I'll keep saying this, right? There are constraints to programming. I need people to understand that. We like to say that anything's possible, but just as there are hardware limitations on the things that we spec in. So if you spec in something with two HDMI ins and you need a third in, you change the device, right? The, the principle is you change the device. Now, programming, you don't think like that because you think, oh, it's a couple lines of code. It's just, how hard can it be? I've heard this question, right? I've never asked this question. I've heard people ask this question, how hard can it be to just add an extra microphone? Um, it's hard because, you know, you're talking about maybe a hundred lines of code, depending on how the programmer built his entire logic, right? And you're coming in six hours before this thing's going live and saying, hey, can you just tweak the code to the, so that we can incorporate an extra microphone? And, and we do it. Programmers are great like that. They will work hard and they'll get it done. But, you know, the next time they have an opportunity, 
they're jumping ship because they're tired of doing this every day. And the reason is the lack of understanding that a lot of people, a lot of subsystems within AV have about what is programming. I think we all need to just get better educated on programming. I mean, it's like, and so that, that again, that's a problem, right? A lot of people say, oh, I hate coding, right? And I'm, I'm one of those people. Like I was never a fan of writing code. Uh, if you asked me to sit and write a hundred lines of code, I wouldn't succeed at that. I'm not, it's not the kind of thing I want to do. But at the same time, have I done it? Yes, I have. And because of that, I have respect for the people that do it. And just, I understand that in my design process. And I've always incorporated that, that, you know, you can't just make something happen because it's code. It still needs work. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy. Yeah. It's like thinking of it as a physical one. It's like telling a sound engineer, oh, you know, you set up for a 10 panel mic system. We're now going to 15 panels. Yeah. And now they yeah. got to adjust for feedback and all that stuff. Now they're running five additional. Ma- uh, I like that. Yeah. That's a good analogy. That's exactly right. Because you've just adding the microphones, maybe the easy part, but now you have to account for all the variances that this edition has brought into it. But yeah, that's kind of like the my foundational perspective on programming. Unless we have a good understanding of the different parts of AV that are non-traditional AV, not saying the programming is not a part of AV. It's been a part of AV for a long time, but it's not, you know, a, a Programmers always seen as a different breed of person, right? And it's not, you know, they're all just like us. Too. We're all the same. We're all technology people. But that understanding needs to go to everyone from the executive leadership all the way up to the tech building a rack. You know, it's like that knowledge. And there's different levels of it. I'm not saying that everybody needs to learn how to code, but at different levels, we need to understand that this is also part of that entire piece. You know, it's a puzzle. We're building something beautiful. This is a very important piece in, on it, you know. Well put. I, you know, one one thing that I, just just to add on to that because I I, I wish that I, I could can this and I could have had this about twenty years ago because it's <laughs> it, it, it's such a it's such a critical conversation that we've been having for so so long. In addition to the fact that you have to respect what goes into this. You also have to know that that comes with a cost and it also a time yes. impact. And mm-hmm. those things also have to be factored into an equation and making changes haphazardly, just like anything could potentially uh, um, violate the integrity of programming. Never mind um, the, the fact that you, you're asking somebody to go outside of what their scope is or doing do something um, last minute that's going to to cause them stress it also could could cause the the previous code to not perform the way it was anticipated because it wasn't factored in to the planning of of the project absolutely absolutely so. i see that happening so much and unfortunately the customer invests a lot of money into having this beautiful project right I mean, it could be anything from you know, a, a conference room all the way to an exper- experiential design that has like thousands of speakers and projectors and whatnot. And, and at the end of the day, uh, the the least visible part of this project is the code that runs all of this. And that's the most significant part, yet it is also the most overlooked part of this project, right? So we we factored in, we need a, a we need the physical architecture to support this we need the space requirements heck we've even gone into architectural acoustic coordination and then um yeah we've allocated 250 hours of programming for this that should be good right is all we get on the programming side and um and you're like yeah it should be but um what are we doing here is a programmer's first question like what am i doing here right and then well, you know, it's a, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a conference room. It's a, that's not enough, right? That's not enough information to run this on, right? You've leveraged, and and again, this is where that relationship with manufacturers also comes into uh, constraints, right? Because manufacturers work hard and they build systems that have a lot of capabilities, right? And without proper training, without proper time, and without the right design methodology, you've wasted so much potential on what could have been an amazingly powerful system. 
and you've just got it to work, right? We are not living in the age of, you know, our, you know, our mile long cable pullers and, you know, analog things going in and snakes and all that. We've gone past that. We're living in a time when there's so much processing power into these small devices. Even something as tiny as a NUC can power like huge systems. I know like massive projects that are designed on very small devices. The computational power that we have today is amazing. Technology has grown to the point where things are condensed and compressed and on the network and there's no need for repetitive cable pulling. You're using the same backbone for everything. But without planning out the design process of the programmer, you've just left them to do what they think is right. And due to the time constraints, yes, they will do the best. They will do what they think is right. But now you have entrusted on the programmer, not just programming, you're asking them to design, you're asking them to become a, a user experience developer, you're asking them to be a field engineer, and you're asking them to be a tech all in one. And that's not a good way of doing any business, right? You allow them to focus on their core strengths. Ask the questions. The discovery process needs to extend into programming. That's, this, that's what I say to all integrators out there. It's what I say to a lot of people who are on the construction side of it. You ha we have an elaborate discovery process. We wouldn't want to put a 50-inch monitor where you only have space for a 21-inch monitor, right? Very simple. Same applies for your programming. What are you trying to do? In the discovery calls that I've been on, part of today, in my any job that I've been doing, one of the first questions that I ask is, who's going to use this system? And what are they trying to do with this system? And they'll be like, well, we talked about this to the salesperson. And I'll say, Kate, would you mind just repeating it to me? I'm the engineer. He, I've I have their take on it. I have that. And I'll explain to them what I have as information today. And my first deliverable to them is giving them a document that says, hey, this is what we understand about your project. Is this right? Because the thing is, we also know that a scope of work document, much as we talk about it, much as we want it to be a part of the thing, it's also something that's very hard to kind of put into a, a stable document. It's an evolving document. It changes. But we need a foundation. And so that's kind of where I've you know, uh, I, I recommend having those conversations early on. It's, it's otherwise, we're just setting ourselves and a whole lot of other people to fail. Well put. <laughs> yeah. These are the conversations. So those of you who haven't tuned in to some of our previous uh, episodes, these are some of the conversations that we love having because the whole concept of this podcast is really to educate and to try to answer some of the questions that people have about programming and what we do, but also help to explain to those who don't know what the importance of programming is. And I think that you just summed up a lot of that just in this last 10 minutes. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> I appreciate it. You, you know, one of the things that I wanted to touch on, you know, as we're rounding up this episode and, and um, just to highlight what Frank said. Frank is the host of the IT Factor, which is an AV Nation podcast, and we're going to be doing a, a crossover episode. So stay tuned to the next one that will both be on this show as well as on Frank's show. Um, but but I, I wanted to also touch on another part of your career and, and a passion of yours, and that's diversity. And that and I know that you're chair of the Avixa Diversity Council. And, and one of the things that, that I look at with diversity, because there's so many different facets, and I really, I absorb all the things that you say about this, because I think it's so fascinating, is, is that every part of, there's so many different angles to diversity. There, there are the things that are obvious, and there are things that are not as obvious. And I think that, you know, that we, we, we here um, uh, have all also looked at uh, the value of women and, and female programmers, but we, we also look at you know, programmers are a minority in general, and they're they're often overlooked in in the AV industry. So maybe talk a little bit about your your perspective on that, and and um, just in general um, for those who want to get more involved in in the diversity council, how how could they do that? 
Well, thank you, Steve. And can I just start off by saying just the language that you've used right now is so inclusive. I'm very appreciative of that. You know, usually when we have diversity conversations, one of the challenges that I faced and that I'm trying to change with every opportunity that I get is the fact that diversity is fascinating. I loved how you said that. That's that's beautiful because it's there's a lot of merit to diversity and it shouldn't be seen as something that we're trying to fit into an agenda or we're doing it because you know people are calling out for it no there's there's beauty in diversity that's what Maya Angelou said you know many years ago there's 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 something special about bringing people with different perspectives and different backgrounds sitting them together and having them express themselves in a safe environment and that's kind of what the objectives of the diversity council are that's what we're trying to do is build uh, an AV industry where hopefully there is more inclusivity. Now, the the challenges that we have is that again, there's a lot of traditional barriers to entry that our industry has put up, and it's not because you know, not no fault to an individual or an organization for that matter. It's just that that's how things have been done for a long time in the AV industry, right? Our career paths, for example, a lot of people, if you want to be on the technical side of AV, you start off in the trenches for lack of a better word. And that trenches in itself is not an inclusive environment. Now, if you are a working mother uh, and you have kids, you cannot be expected to be traveling or in the field for a week or three days at a time. Now, this is where we've grown. Our industry is not that tech who becomes a, a site super, who becomes an engineer, who becomes a project manager. That's not our path anymore. There's lateral entry. It's accessible. You can actually become a programmer without actually having to be in the field. There's plenty of ways to do that. We have enough of, which is why I do hope that our industry, the path of software adoption that we're on, please keep at it because you may not know what you're doing, but you're actually making lives easy for a lot of people who wanna get into AV. Just the fact that you're adopting software, because now if somebody wants to test a piece of gear, you don't actually have to go into a rack closet. There's virtualization, there's a software tool, there's something that can simulate what that is. And yes, is it good to be in the field? Absolutely, if there's an opportunity, if you're physically able to do that, it is absolutely something you should do. But that should not be a barrier. So by breaking down the barriers, by adopting software and by understanding that the, a, a unique diversity that you know a lot of times get overlooked is that you know the programming the group of programmers in AV are always a very limited group of people. I mean you'll have I don't know what the ratio is, but you're never going to have like uh, you know them as in equal numbers to the text. There's always going to be you know lesser programmers. maybe there's 10 texts to one program. I'm just throwing out a random number here. But in that limited crowd, by having more people come into the industry through IT, somebody who has, uh, say you're a full stack developer, you have uh, a couple of programming lang languages on the front end and the back end, and you're pretty good at that, and you want to get into AV, yeah, there should be a path for that. you know. And I think the, the call to action for a lot of people is that how can we open up our workplaces so that we have more opportunities for entry-level people. At any given point of time, if you look through the AV industry and the job postings associated, you'll never find a ton of associate engineers or you know entry-level programmers. Those positions are always a rarity, and that shouldn't be the case. We have the opportunity to cultivate the next generation of AV professionals, if we can just open that up. So those are some of the things that we try to work on. We try to advocate and just try to say that, you know, opening us up is, is great, not just for the cause of diversity, but it's also, there's a business case for this. It's beneficial for your organization by having your organization and your setup more open to a larger talent pool, right? So there is, there's a significant advantage to working on the diversity side of things. So that's what we do at the Diversity Council. We organize webinars, we have workshops. Our messaging is simple. You know, we respect who you are. We respect your individual diversity journey and we accept who that is. You know, no questions asked. And it's as simple as that. Diversity is quite simple in that, in that sense. It's just mutual acceptance of our differences and understanding those differences and providing a safe space for people to express their concerns. 
and that it just it's just organically it keeps growing you know if if anyone's interested you know please check us out on the evixa website there we have our monthly meetings it's a great place to be you know it's a very open play forum where you can talk about things and you know we educate each other we learn there's diversity is also about learning you're never going to get to the point where you've understood or you become uh, an expert in diversity it's about keeping your minds open every day and learning and i think from an industry perspective just the fact that we're opening up our doors to more IT professionals, more network engineers, more programmers from outside of AB and to come in, you know, when you question yourself and your organization, hey, if I were to bring in an IT professional, is my workplace, uh, do they get that sense of belonging there? Do they feel like they're part of something? Just ask yourself that and divine, design policies. As long as you are trying, I respect that. You know, it's it's you can't just hope that it'll happen there needs to be some intentionality to it. That's the only thing that I would say, right? You need to be intentional about your diversity practices. You just have to look at it and say, hey, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should do this. Maybe my messaging should be like this. Maybe the terminology that I use should be this. Small things, you know, this how meetings are done. How are your meetings? Do you, does your meetings have equal opportunity for everyone on there? Uh, do you provide equity to your to your organization, to your employees? Small things, like small changes add up and build into something that's much more powerful. And that's always been my perspective on diversity. I think that's fairly simple to understand. And as AV professionals, it's something that we do in every facet of our life, of our professional lives every day. Adopt the same thing to diversity because it's something you don't know. It's something we don't understand. It's some there we know some. We, there are things we don't know. Keep learning. Keep learning and implementing and being intentional. And you know, I think that builds for a better, better industry for us. And uh, I, I'm glad. I'm glad, Steve, you brought it up. And you know, it's like I do hope that the listeners understand that there is. You know, we are. There's a lot of allies here. There's a lot of supportive people in this industry as well. We're we're very open. We are here for you. You know, that's that's the message that I want to share with everyone. We're there. There's a lot of people you can just reach out. I mean, anyone on this call, uh, anyone, you know, just ask them a question. You know, we might not know the answer, but we will definitely do our best to point you in the right direction. Probably one of the biggest things that we talk about on the show is the programmer is like the person on an island. A lot of times they, yes. they're they they're that one unique individual in the company or on a team, and they don't really have peers because the, not a lot of companies have the luxury of having multiple programmers. That's and that's true. why we're trying to develop a community and build um, a recognition and, and um, a, a visibility for what programmers do on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad. I'm glad you're, you know, this, uh, the whole concept behind Ask the Programmer, I like that, you know, it's, it's just about building a community and, you know, just having, giving people options that, hey, you want to listen to another group of people that, you know, think like you, that talk like you. We have that commonality, right? It's, we should absolutely leverage that. While we're seeking uh, diversities, we have something that makes us all common, like your 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 love for programming, the fact that you are a professional on the programming side. It's it's something that you know you have some common ground there. That's how we can build out you know uh, a, a more inclusive community. Just use the common ground, find ways to include other people. I love the, I love it. You know I I do wish the both of you the greatest success on the show. It's I know it's a great show. So. Thanks. I'm sorry if you that. can't see my video. Saying that <laughs> <one>. <laughs> James, I know that um, Frank w was uh, re somebody that you wanted to uh, make sure that we highlight. Have we touched on all the areas that you wanted to cover? If you're listening to this episode and don't understand why I want to have Frank on here, you're not listening to this episode. <laughs> oh, Frank James. has put things Thank so you. elegant and <laughs> Every time I deal with Frank, like it, I've listened to him on tons of different podcasts, every interaction, he always puts it in the best elegant way. Like I'll come up with this idea, be like, say something. And then Frank will take it and puts it so elegant. And everyone's like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's great about Frank. And that's why I wanted to have him on. 
Oh, James, I wish everybody has a James King in their lives. They deserve it because it's this is the kind of support that I want to hear. Like beginning of the year, happy new year, by the way, to everyone. And you know, this is exactly how a person would want to have their day. Thank you, James. That was that's so kind of you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I only speak the truth here. I mean, but thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I, again, like I said, I, you and I have been connected from like day one with the AVs IT. I, yes, we um, have. And but really has grown from that. And like I said, it's uh, mutual respect there. I know you said you you look I up do. to me, but I really look up to you. Like, oh, thank you, and Steve. <laughs> like you guys, I feel you guys are the face, the future of AV in each aspect. That you guys do thank you thank you thank you well, i hope that i could still be the future but i appreciate that i think that you guys are more <laughs> of the future but i i, I want to be there with you as long as i as long as i can and the, and the industry's in good hands if you with you guys be in the future so uh, but that's a great place for us to wrap this one and, and it's always so great to to have um, somebody that really speaks our language so thank you frank for um, joining and providing us that valuable insight um, again, stay tuned for the next episode to, to hear more from Frank, but um, until then, how can people get in touch with you, uh, learn more about what you're doing at Audinate and also any of your work that uh, you, you'd like to share? Sure. Uh, I'm on the socials. I'm pretty much there on all of them. Uh, Frank Patakala on Twitter, I tweet and I'm on LinkedIn. So feel free to add me there as well. Uh, our company's Audinate. I mean, you should be able to find us at audinate.com. And then for anything diversity council related, I mean, just reach out to me. I'll, you know, I, I can point you in the right direction. Excellent. And I'm sure that if Frank can make time in his schedule, he'll be back for more down the line as well. So oh, absolutely. That. Absolutely. That's a, it's, you know, if I had, I'd love to be on this show. It's, it's great. It's, it's a place where I can talk my language. I love it. Wonderful. James, um, any closing thoughts and how can people reach out and get in touch with you and learn more about what you're up to? Um, definitely closing thoughts is connect with Frank on social. You're going to learn from him. He's going to help you grow your, uh, circle of network. Cause not only does he have connections with the AV folks, he also have connection with some outstanding it folks as well. So definitely, uh, connect with him and watch your network grow from there. Uh, you can always connect with me, AV underscore James King on Twitter, where I, tend to be on AV in the AM. Uh, I did take a little break this uh, Sunday, so I wasn't active on it, even though it's a great topic. And um, Ensing Hepma and higheredav.com, where I write the monthly article, AV and IT, or IT and AV. Fantastic. For It's always good to uh, re reach out and, and make these connections, so please be sure to do that. And, and uh, as... Um, uh, James said, uh, follow Frank and, and also leave a comment on this episode. We'd like to hear what uh, you you think. And um, the one thing that we didn't touch on, which we're definitely going to sometime down the line is Frank did kind of drop that little message that he is a master's in cybersecurity. So I think we'll touch on that sometime later on. But uh, for me, you can reach me at Steve Greenblatt on social media. My company is Control Concepts and they can be found at controlconcepts.net. I do uh, some writing for um, SCN, for um, uh, AV Network, and also Commercial Integrator, and the uh, State of Control podcast on AV Nation, which is uh, the same family of podcasts as Frank's IT Factor. So please check both of those out. And um, we, we definitely would like to hear from you. We'd like to have more guests on. We'd like to be answering more questions. So please reach out to us on um, social I'm um, at Steve Greenblatt, as I mentioned, and James is um, AV underscore James King. So uh, please uh, let us know what you think. Leave a rating review, share your favorite episode with your friend, and we'd like to hear more from you. And until the next time, this has been Ask the Programmer. <laughs>